Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, tonight, this is going to be part nine of our study of the Sri Maladevi Simhanada Sutra. Um, and tonight is a very exciting night. It's always a very exciting night in the Sri Maladevi Sutra, but tonight's very exciting. Um, so this is part nine of our series here, but what we're actually up to is chapter, we're actually up to chapter eight, but we're going to take a quick peek back at chapter seven, because even though I read chapter seven, it came and went so quickly that we need to remind ourselves of what was said there. Um, since this is part nine of this series, I don't feel like I really need to recap the whole story in that way. We know about Srimala. We know about um, uh, her lion's roar. In fact, last week, we even heard the kind of explicit definition of the lion's roar. Um, this was all part of, just as a little reminder, this was all part of Srimala Devi's um, her presentation of the Dharma, and she's giving us a lot of different ideas to think about. And one of the, the, the ideas that she's been playing with is this idea about the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas, the voice hearers and the solitary enlightened ones, and how that kind of maybe earlier form of Buddhism or the more rigidly monastic form of Buddhism or the very rugged individualist form of solitary forest practice. Sri Maladevi is making a, a case that there's a shortcoming in that way of doing Buddhism. And so she's been presenting what basically would come to be known as Mahayana Buddhism. It's certainly what she calls it is Mahayana Buddhism or even Ekyayana Buddhism, the single vehicle. These are all ideas that she's been talking about. And if there's one idea, if there's one single idea that the Sri Maladevi Simhanada Sutra is, is famous for, it's this idea here, the Tathagata Garbha, the Tathagata Garbha. <laughs> um, so I, this is a, probably the hardest, this has got to be the hardest word in Buddhism to translate. So this is the Sanskrit, of course, Tath Agata Garbha. Uh, I have the Chinese up there, the Ru Lai Zhang. And then a, an attempt, a quick attempt at a translation, this, the womb of thus come ones. I, I, I mean, even just beginning to say it, it doesn't make any sense really at this point. But this is the idea that this sutra is very famous for articulating. It's sort of considered Sri Mala Devi's, the, the big news that she's come to tell us about. And we just encountered this term in our little tiny paragraph called chapter seven. And since this is the central teaching of the sutra, and since it's kind of all been building up to this idea, I wanted to take a step back I'm going to reread chapter seven really quickly to refresh our memory. But before I do that, I kind of want to just say a couple of things about the language here. And then we'll read what she says about it. But even before we kind of understand what it is, let's just get the language right here. So tonight, like I said, is an exciting night because if you've ever heard of the expression Buddha nature, that all beings have Buddha nature, all things have Buddha nature. If you've heard of this idea of Buddha nature, ta-da, this, this is what we're talking about. In fact, the, the idea of Buddha nature is actually this idea of Tathagata Garbha. And after I get done with this, you know, you're going to wonder about that the, the idea of Buddha nature. Like, why did they come to call this Buddha nature? Um, so I might be complicating things at first, but it's only to clarify things. So um, 
yeah, let me quickly define the the ideas of this word. So it's a it's a combined term of it's a combination of two terms, tathagata and garbha. In Sanskrit, it's one big crazy word, but it has these two parts, tathagata and garbha. Tathagata, of course, we encounter this word tathagata practically every Sunday night. It's one of the 10 titles for a fully enlightened being. And it essentially means coming out of or arriving, coming out of or arriving of thusness, of suchness. And that idea of suchness or, or thusness is tathata. And suchness or thusness is this idea of a, of a deep, deep presence, uh, very, very deeply present, even more present than the present moment, which is kind of an idea. This is like really, really present. That's tathagat, or sorry, that's tathata, like presence. And then a way of talking about a fully enlightened being is it's a it's a being that agatas that arrives out of tathata it's the tathagata arising out of thusness this is why they usually translate tathagata as thus come thusly come from thusness and again this is a, a title for a buddha but buddha is another title for a fully enlightened being so but that idea so we know about Tathagata. We talk, again, we talk about Tathagata all the time. But a Tathagata Garbha, we don't talk that often about Garbhas. They've come up a few times, I have to say, on Dharma doors, and I haven't really mentioned it too many times. The word would normally be translated. If, if we were just dealing with this Chinese character here, Zhang. If we were just to deal with that, the Chinese is more like, yeah, like a, a treasury, a repository where you would store all of your all of your goods, all of your jewels, like a treasury, maybe even all of your weapons if it were an armory. But the idea is it's no specific kind of repository. It's just a repository. Now that's if we were only dealing with the, the Chinese, but this is the Chinese translation of this Sanskrit idea of a garbha. Now the idea of a garbha does have to do also with a repository, but in Sanskrit, not in Chinese, but in Sanskrit, there is the primary meaning of this word, or sorry, not this word, not the Chinese, but garbha. There is the primary Sanskrit meaning of a womb, like where babies grow and are birthed from in that sense. And there's a lot of, a tremendous amount of commentary on this term, Tathagata Garbha. What does the womb of Tathagata, what does that mean? Some interpreters, will suggest that you ignore the, the meaning of womb and kind of lean more towards the idea of a treasury or something like that. I don't really agree with those interpretations. I think that actually misses a tremendous amount of significance, especially within the context of this sutra of Sri Mala, Queen Sri Mala. I've already pointed out a few times how feminine this sutra is, a lot of the analogies and metaphors that Srimala uses are very feminine, very motherly in that way. So I don't think it's entirely an accident that they're talking about this womb of the Tathagata. But I want to give you another way of thinking about Tathagata, or sorry, of Garbha, the, the womb word. This word garbha is also can be and is often translated into English as 
matrix, like a mathematical matrix. But in that sense, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dissuade you from thinking of the matrix, like the movie, right? Meaning that there's this way in which, you know, all phenomena in, you know, if you're Neo and you're inside the matrix, right? You're inside that computer world. There's a way in which anything that happens in there is of the matrix, right? It's of, comes out of the program, the program of the matrix, right? And so you can kind of start to see the matrix, that world, that computer program as like a womb or a repository out of which comes all the various phenomena that Neo would see in the matrix or anybody would see in the matrix. That word matrix as a choice for translating Garbha is also very interesting because our English word matrix, like the word matrix for like a mathematical matrix of all these interdependent um, numbers in that way, or like the movie, The Matrix, that word matrix originally comes from Sanskrit. In fact, it comes from a word called matrika, matrika. And matrika is, you know, again, it's where we get the word matrix from, but matrika has the root of mater, meaning mother. And in fact, these matrika, these lists of lists is essentially what a matrika, a matrix in the world of Buddhism are lists of lists. You might even have lists inside of lists, inside of lists. And all of those lists within lists within lists are matrika. And that word matrika, the root of which is matter, is mother. And they even refer to those matrika as the mothers. In fact, they sometimes even say the mothers of all Buddhas because they are actually from that knowledge, from that wisdom, from that Dharma database, out of which arises all Buddhas. It's the womb of Buddhahood in that way. <laughs> so that's sort of a freestyle definition of Tathagata Garbha. This idea of the womb of, of Tathagata, the womb, where do where do Tathagatas come from? <laughs> Out of the womb of thusness in that way. That's one way of thinking about it. But again, I, I've probably said too much because Srimala is going to tell us what the Tathagata Garbha is. I just wanted to kind of let you know what the full connotation of that word is. It is this matrix or this repository or this even this womb out of which arises all thus come ones, all tathagatas. Okay, that's just, and, and again, that's just the language, the words. We're gonna find out Srimala's uh, definition of what this is all about. And again, the whole sutra is about this idea. Before I reread, before I reread little tiny paragraph of chapter seven, I also just want to remind you that we're talking about these four noble truths. And this was another thing that, you know, we actually started in chapter five last time. We cruised through chapter six, right into chapter seven. We even got into, I think, chapter eight a tiny bit. So I want to pull back because we didn't have a real quick chance to talk about our good old four noble truths. So Srimala is in the middle, she's deep actually in the middle of this discourse about, again, about the shortcomings of the Shravaka path, shortcomings of the Pratekya Bhutta path. And what she's been talking about lately, meaning like last time, is that, oh yeah, the Shravakas, the voice hearers, the Pratekya Bhuttas, the solitary enlightened ones, they don't have a full, complete understanding of the Four Noble Truths. They only have a partial or incomplete understanding of the Four Noble Truths. And because of that, 
they haven't attained complete nirvana. Um, Srimala is very clear that it is only a tathagata, one of those beings out of thusness. It is only a tathagata that completely understands the Four Noble Truths. And, and I want to kind of remind you of something about the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths, of course, were the Buddha's very, very first teaching. After the Great Enlightenment in the Deer Park, under the Bodhi Tree, the, the Buddha went and taught the Four Noble Truths. And that is actually the subject, the contents of the very, very first sutra. That's it. And the Four Noble Truths, of course, and I'm not going to, I actually even entertain the idea of doing a Dharma talk on the Four Noble Truths a little bit tonight, but I know you know the Four Noble Truths. But what I wanted to remind you of about that very, very first sutra is it's actually not just about the Four Noble Truths, this idea of suffering, this truth of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering or the accumulation of suffering the truth of the cessation of suffering, and then the noble truth of the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. Those four noble truths, the Buddha says first, like you should know that there's even the existence of this idea of four noble truths. But then he goes on to say that there's sort of another way of looking at the Four Noble Truths. And that is in what would be called the imperative mode. The imperative mode, meaning that you should really understand what's being spoken about here. Not just that you know there's four noble <laughs> truths, <laughs> and not just that you know that the first one is the truth of suffering, or that there's the truth of the accumulation of suffering or the truth of cessation of suffering, or that there's the truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Just knowing about them is one thing. But this imperative that they should really be understood is the second turning of the Dharma wheel. In that same sutra, the Buddha goes on to say that these also should in a way be fully understood and what the Buddha says at the end of the very first sutra is that it wasn't until I understood the Four Noble Truths in these three ways, meaning that they just exist, that there's a certain imperative urgency in a sense to understanding them, and then the third turning, an actual, full, clear realization and understanding and knowledge of the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha says, it wasn't until I understood the Four Noble Truths in those three ways that I declared myself a thus come one, a tathagata. That sort of the, the idea that the Four Noble Truths are kind of out there, and there's this imperative to understand them, and then there's even this capability. I think that's really the important part of the third turning, is that they're talking about a uh, a capacity, a capability for a full understanding of those things. So I wanted to remind you of that kind of architecture, if you will, of the Four Noble Truths, and also wanted to remind you that that was the first teaching of the Buddha. It was the, the, the seemingly the most important thing he kind of had to, to say in that way, because it was the very first thing. And the reason why I wanted to remind us of that is that even though this is one of those wild Mahayana sutras where we have this Srimala person telling us all this stuff, and we're still talking about good old Buddhism, <laughs> good old fashioned Four Noble Truths, not suffering Buddhism. And Srimala is still is in the business of trying to help us not suffer. And so I wanted to just remind you that this is really classic Buddhism but it's being done in a really interesting new way, all right? So on that note, Srimala has started to talk about the Four Noble Truths in, in kind of a whole new way. 
that we've never even seen before or heard before. And so, unless there's any burning questions before we dive in, chapter seven. Chapter seven reads something like this. World honored one, Sri Mala says, the real noble truths are very profound, very subtle, difficult to perceive, hard to understand, and not to be discriminated. They are beyond the realm of thought and speculation, and they transcend the creeds of all worlds. They are known only to Tathagatas, worthy ones, perfectly enlightened ones. How so? These truths explain the very profound Tathagata Garbha, the womb of Tathagatas. The Tathagata Garbha belongs in the realm of the Buddha and is beyond the domain of Shravaka voice hearers and Pratekya Buddha solitary enlightened ones. Since the noble truths are explained on the basis of the Tathagata Garbha, and since the Tathagata Garbha is profound and subtle, the noble truths are also profound and subtle, difficult to perceive, hard to understand, and not to be discriminated. They are beyond the realm of thought and speculation and transcend the creeds of all worlds. They can be known only by a Tathagata, a worthy one, a perfectly enlightened one. All right, so, and that's sort of just a statement about the Tathagata Garbha. Now we get to chapter eight. If one has no doubt about the Tathagata Garbha, which in ordinary beings is wrapped in an incalculable number of defilements, there will be no doubt about the Dharmakaya of the Tathagata, which is beyond all defilement. Okay, yeah, before I read the next paragraph, I just want to pause for a second. I meant to mention something at the top. I can mention it now, which is actually a really great place to mention it. So there is a very famous Mahayana Sutra called the Tathagata Garbha Sutra. <laughs> it's pretty much the go-to source of information for this idea of the Tathagata Garbha beyond the Srimala Devi Sutra. The thing is, though, if you go and get a copy of the Tathagata, there is an English translation of this, and you go get it and read the Tathagata Garbha Sutra, what you're going to read are nine similes that the Buddha gives to describe this idea of the womb of Tathagata, this uh, Tathagata Garbha. And all nine of the similes pretty much function the same way. The, the nuances of each simile are what make them beautiful similes, but the underlying metaphor is one of a pearl dipped in mud, for example, to, to choose one of nine. And this idea of something pure, something wonderful in that way, being obscured from the outside. That's sort of the working metaphor of all nine of those similes that the Buddha gives. And they're exactly like what she just says. If one has no doubt about the Tathagata Garbha, which in ordinary beings is wrapped in an, in, in an incalculable number of defilements. So if one has no about, doubt about that, there will be no doubt about the dharmakaya, the dharma body of the Tathagata, which is beyond all defilement. And I, I want to remind you too that the dharmakaya is a very important idea that's popped up a few times. Srimala keeps teasing this like idea of the dharmakaya. And here we kind of really start to get an explicit 
definition or at least relationship here. She goes on to say, world honored one, if one can have true faith in the Tathagata Garbha and the Buddha's Dharma Kaya, body of Dharma, the inconceivable esoteric realm of the Buddhas, then they will be able to believe in and understand well the two meanings of the Four Noble Truths. Everybody ready for the two meanings of the Four Noble Truths? This is like new information. What are the two meanings of the Four Noble Truths, she says? They are the conditioned and the unconditioned. The conditioned noble truths are the four noble truths in an incomplete sense. How so? When one has to rely on others for protection, they cannot completely know suffering, completely eradicate all causes of suffering, realize the complete cessation of suffering, or follow in its entirety the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Therefore, they cannot know conditioned things, unconditioned things, or nirvana. World honored one, the unconditioned noble truths refer to the four noble truths in the complete sense. How so? Because when one can rely on themselves for protection and can complete, that person can completely know suffering, completely eradicate all causes of suffering, realize the complete cessation of suffering, and follow in its entirety the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Thus, there are in all eight noble truths mentioned. However, the Buddha teaches them only in terms of the four noble truths. The meaning of the unconditioned four noble truths is perfectly realized by only by Tathagatas, worthy ones, perfectly enlightened ones, and is beyond the capacity of arhats, pratekya buddhas. How so? Because nirvana is not to be realized by any dharma, by anything, whether superior, inferior, low, middle, high. What does it mean that the Tathagatas perfectly realize the unconditioned dharmas, the unconditioned Four Noble Truths? The Tathagatas, the worthy ones, the supremely enlightened ones, completely know suffering, have eradicated all causes of suffering, which are the kleshas, the underlying defilements that she's been talking about now. <laughs> they, the Tathagatas, worthy ones, supremely enlightened ones, have realized the complete cessation of all suffering, even that derived from the aggregates of a mind-created body. And Tathagatas, perfectly enlightened ones, have followed in its entirety the path leading to the cessation of suffering. World honored one, the term cessation of suffering does not imply the destruction of anything. How so? because the cessation of suffering has no beginning, no action, no origination, and no end. It is ever abiding, immovable, intrinsically pure, and free from the shell of all defilements. World Honored One, the Tathagata has achieved inconceivable dharmas, more numerous than the sands of the Ganges River, 
dharmas which embody the wisdom of liberation and which are referred to as the dharma kaya world honored one when this dharma kaya is not apart from defilements it is called the tathagata garbha world honored one actually i'm going to pause there because that's actually a new chapter we'll pause there we'll back it up <laughs> Questions, comments, answers, ideas about the Tathagata Garbha. Okay, then let me just kind of walk us through just a couple of things. She set up this interesting paradigm of these sort of conditioned Four Noble Truths and these unconditioned Four Noble Truths. Conditioned in Buddhism, of course, is this idea of samskrita, samskrita dharma versus asamskrita dharma. Conditioned things, conditioned dharmas, unconditioned dharmas. For the most part, anything and everything we could possibly think of is conditioned or conditional, is a conditioned dharma in the sense that anything you could possibly think of, if you really look at it, just look at it actually, you'll notice it's relative. Your understanding of it is relative to something else. It's conditional in some way, shape or form, whether it's just, just this one, the division between that which belongs to me, meaning my body, that which I identify with, and then that which I don't identify with. Oh, look, it's a book. But a book's not me. I'm me. So now all of a sudden, if it's this skin or the hair or whatever it is, is now part of the me side of this. And then there's all the other things. But either of those is now conditional. What I consider myself is now relative to and conditional based upon that which I have excluded from the equation called self and vice versa. And now all of a sudden, just that, that primary divide of self and other creates conditionality. And then the conditionality just goes wild from there, just conditions upon conditions and relativity upon relativity. So pretty much anything and everything you could possibly imagine, think of, is conditional. And that's kind of the problem. <laughs> is the slippery, almost inexistent nature of the conditional. It's so conditional in that way. And then there's this idea of the asamskrita dharma, unconditioned dharma, that which is not conditional. It's almost impossible to think of that which is actually not conditional. It's almost absolutely impossible. Inconceivable is what they often talk about in the world of Buddhism. So Srimala has interestingly... Have, uh, yeah, oh yeah, Connie. Um, what do you think about the idea of that the unconditioned gives rise to the condition? I think that's the message of the Srimala Devi Sutra. <laughs> Just hold on. She's going to lay that out in, in, in great detail. Beautiful. Absolutely. So she has set up this beautiful, interesting paradigm where she's saying that the four noble truths, there's the conditional four noble truths, and there's the unconditional, unconditioned four noble truths. So actually, there's eight four noble truths. The Buddha just talks about four, though, right? So she sets this kind of paradigm up. Again, the unconditioned, this kind of beyond reach nature of the Four Noble Truths is totally the, the, the domain of Tathagatas. That's, that's it. Okay. But then she sa says something really, really interesting. I actually, it's one of those things that you, I, I missed it many times having read this sutra, only getting ready for tonight, um, did I catch it. And what it is, is that really interesting line. It's the very last thing she says, actually. World honored one. 
the Tathagata has achieved inconceivable dharmas more numerous than the sands of the Ganges rivers, dharmas which embody the wisdom of liberation and which are referred to as the Dharmakaya. So we got a definition of the Dharmakaya, right? The in, these inconceivable dharmas realized by the Tathagata. But hold on though. She says, world on and one, when this Dharmakaya is not apart from defilements, it is called the Tathagata Garbha. Uh, now we got to be on our grammar. You got to be you got to be careful with your grammar, right? Because they're doing some double negatives on us there, right? So when the dharmakaya is not apart from the defilements, I think another way of saying that is when the dharmakaya is with defilement. Am I right? Right? That's how grammar works, right? Not apart is being with in that way. So. World on one, when the Dharmakaya is not apart from defilements, it is called the Tathagata Garbha. What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, honestly, Tanya, I, I honestly don't think we're quite supposed to understand just yet. If you know what I mean. Like at this yeah. point, we're supposed to really want to know. <laughs> or is it like the two truths because it's like the things are you know nope nope no nope, no nope. nope. okay it's actually um uh, uh, okay yeah connie said it already what they're talking about in a way is this the womb of thusness is samsara <laughs> it's where all the buddhas come from they don't come from another planet they don't come from some other realm they don't come from whatever they actually come right out of samsara and that's where you get into this idea of all beings having the, this Buddha nature, because it, it's all right here to be realized in that way. So that's just the answer, Tanya, is that idea that when the Dharmakaya is wrapped up and she keeps using this beautiful metaphor of the shells of ignorance, the shells of defilement being wrapped up. And you can kind of start to think of that as a a fetus in a womb. It's a way of describing being in samsara is actually you, we are, are Buddha babies in the womb. Gestating is the idea. And that's why I actually say that I don't think we should avoid the womb analogy here, because if they're talking about a Dharma Kaya, a Dharma body, now it's like, well, where does this... Uh, where does this Dharmakaya come from? The Tathagata Garbha. I don't know where your physical body of form came from. Last time I checked, mine, as I understand it, came from my mother's womb in that way. Well, that's the body of form. The idea is, is that there's this deeper Dharmakaya that is in the womb of the Tathagata Garbha in that way. So that's the, the reading of it. That's the interpretation of it. We ready to move on to chapter nine. All right. So now that we have all that quite under control, all those ideas, she says, world honored one, the Tathagata Garbha is the Tathagata's knowledge of emptiness. The Tathagata Garbha has never been seen or realized by any Shravaka or Pratyakya Buddha. It is perceived and witnessed only by the Buddhas. World Honored One, the knowledge of emptiness of the Tathagata Garbha is of two kinds. What are the two kinds? The first is the knowledge that the Tathagata Garbha is empty. <laughs> that is, sorry, it is empty. That it is apart from all defilements and apart from knowledge which does not lead to liberation. 
The second is the knowledge that the Tathagata Garbha is not empty, that it contains inconceivable dharmas more numerous than the sands of the Ganges River, rivers, which embody the Buddha's wisdom of liberation. <clears throat> and yes, by the way, Tanya, that was a two truths kind of thing that they dropped on you. Not exact, it's, it isn't actually the two truths in that way, but it is this idea where she says that this Tathagata Garba is empty, but it's not empty. And, you know, that sort of makes a little bit of sense if, if, especially if you've been studying with me and you kind of know my teaching about the idea of emptiness, but then this other idea of what I call fullness, this tathata as fullness. And it's sort of two sides of the same coin in that way, total emptiness or everything at once. <laughs> and it's sort of, again, two sides of the same coin. I read what Srimala said in a very similar way that this embryo, this matrix of the Tathagatas is empty because it's just like everything else. If it's a concept, if it's an idea, it has the same empty nature in that way, right? And well, yeah, let's just leave it at that because she there's a lot more coming. This is just really laying the foundation for much more information. Okay, so we're 101. She tells us that advanced shravakas, advanced voice hearers, can, through faith, gain access to these two knowledges of emptiness. World Honored One, the knowledge of emptiness possessed by the shravakas and pratekyabhutas is connected with and revolves around the four wrong views. Therefore, no shravaka or Prateki Buddha has ever perceived or realized the complete cessation of suffering. Only the Buddha has realized it directly, has eradicated all defilements and followed in its entirety the path leading to the cessation of suffering. That's the end of chapter nine, by the way. Chapter 10. World Honored One, of the Four Noble Truths, three truths are impermanent, and one truth is permanent. How's that? The three noble truths of suffering, the cause of suffering, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering, belong to the realm of conditioned dharmas. What is conditioned is impermanent, and what is impermanent is destructible. What is destructible is not true, not permanent, and not a refuge. Therefore, in the ultimate sense, the three noble truths are not true, not permanent, not a refuge. Or of honored one, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering is beyond the realm of conditioned dharmas. What is beyond the realm of conditioned dharmas is ever abiding by nature. What is ever abiding by nature is indestructible. What is indestructible is true, permanent, and a refuge. For this reason, world honored one, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering is in the ultimate sense, true, permanent, and a refuge. All right, I'm gonna, I wanna talk a little bit about that because that's a really powerful statement. So she's still working within this conditioned, unconditioned idea. And she does this really interesting thing. I've never seen this, never heard this anywhere else, but in this sutra, this is new information in that way. But it's brilliant though. It's dharmically brilliant, I have to say. 
so what she does is she takes the four normal truths and using this conditioned unconditioned formula says that the first one, the second one, and the fourth one are conditional. But that third one, nirodha, is the word. Nirodha means cessation. It's effectively nirvana is what we're talking about. The third one is the idea of the cessation of suffering, nirodha. And she says that, that the third noble truth is unconditioned. That is the unconditioned. That's what we're talking about. That's the one. That's the one. And if you think about it just for a moment, the idea is, let's take the noble truth of suffering. Let's take the first noble truth. While the noble truth of suffering is this noble truth of the harsh realities of life, <laughs> the harsh realities of getting old, getting sick, and dying, and experiencing death, and having people around, that, that is suffering right? But the interesting thing is, if you think about suffering, it is truly conditional. Your suffering is uniquely yours, mine is mine, and it's relative, very conditional to my life. In fact, absolutely conditional to my life, my karma, my wants, my desires, my attachments. Point is, though, my suffering is conditional to my attachments. Your suffering would be conditional to your attachments. So the whole dukkha the whole nature of dukkha is about conditionality in I, that sense yeah connie i have just one comment thinking yeah. about just noble truth i think it's oftentimes um mis uh, misunderstood in the sense that um death um death um sickness and getting older is per se not the suffering getting old is not the suffering and, and death is not the suffering, right? It's only the narrative around it, the story around it and not the, the rejection <clears throat> around it. So I think, um, yeah, I, for me, that made, makes a, you know, it's a whole, yeah, it's very different to understand. The well, yeah, absolutely, Connie. And I mean, in many ways, I, you know, in many ways, it's actually excellent to say this, like based on your comment, there are so many interpretations of dukkha, of what suffering means, and that it too points to its conditionality in that sense, in such a beautiful way, right? And what I mean, of course, is yes, Connie, there's like a lot of um, subtle nuances to the idea of dukkha, even within the world of Buddhism, it has undergone many different changes. Buddhism, I often mention, used to be a lot more Gnostic in its approach to this world, which was basically the view that anything of this world was, you don't want to have anything to do with this world, anything. In fact, even food is like, I mean, we got to do it, but, but the idea was is that dukkha in one early interpretation it was the view that anything of this realm, whether it's a visible form or some sound or a smell or a taste or a feeling or even a thought, anything is dukkha. That was one of the original interpretations of what the because, Buddha meant. When he, is this because it leads or is the, the nature of everything, food, everything is, is impermanence and that's that causes? That is very much in line with what Srimala is getting at is the, the impermanence of these things is what makes them dukkha, makes them suffering in that way, a among many other things. But again, I digress. The idea is, is that the, even the definition of suffering and what suffering means for you, what suffering means for me, it's all going to be very, very, very conditional. Now let's take a peek at the second noble truth, which says that attachment, upadana, are actually craving, desiring, wanting, that leads to attachment, but the very craving, that is the cause of dukkha. That this idea of wanting it to be permanent, the idea of wanting it to whatever it is, and then not getting what we want and suffering in that way. But the idea is, is that your wants and desires are conditional. They're, they're, again, they're not mine. 
they're unique to each of us. So very, very relative, very conditional. Now let's take that jump, jump over the third noble truth and just talk about the, the path leading to the cessation of suffering, the noble, the eightfold path. Well, again, each of those steps will be specific to our own lives. It, it, the, the idea that a, the eightfold path for a monastic shaving their head twice a month is a different eightfold path than the eightfold path of a householder or a lay person in that sense. So the eightfold path and the way you walk the path and what each step on the path means, also relative. Okay, so first noble truth is conditional. Second noble truth is conditional. Fourth noble truth is conditional. The third noble truth, the cessation of suffering, unconditional. That's what Srimala says. The third one is unconditional. And that's actually, you know, from, a, from a, a Dharma teacher point of view, just from the Dharma's point of view, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> of course, that's the idea, is that we are wrapped up in a world of conditional things and suffering as a result of being wrapped up in that world of conditional things. The truth of the cessation of suffering all along has been not getting wrapped up in conditional things i.e. the unconditioned. So that's her, that's for Sri Mala's beautiful teaching of the Four Noble Truths, is that only the third one is this unconditioned truth in that way. Questions, answers, ideas. It goes deeper, though. It is deeper. <laughs> All right, let's go deeper. So yeah, now we're on, I don't even know where we are. I think we are now on chapter 12. We cru we've, we're cruising through chapters. All right. Uh, did we do 11? 11 was one paragraph that said that was the one that the, um, oh, you know, it's so interesting. Yeah. It, 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 um, so chapter 10 is the one that says that the three noble truths, the first, second, and fourth are conditional. You have to wait until the next chapter to find out about how it is that the third noble truth is unconditioned. I read those all at once because I didn't want to leave you hanging. I, want, I knew that you would want to know what was up with that other noble truth. Okay, but now that we're on, we got that all under control, world honored one. This noble truth of the cessation of suffering, number three, is inconceivable. It's beyond the realm of all sentient beings' minds, all consciousnesses. It's also beyond the domain of all arhats and Pratekya Buddha's knowledge. Just as the myriad colors of a rainbow cannot be seen by a man born blind, or as the sun cannot be seen by an infant, so the noble truth of the cessation of suffering cannot be an object of ordinary people's minds or consciousnesses, nor is it in the domain of any of the Shravakas or Pratekya Buddha's knowledge. The consciousness of ordinary people refers to the two extreme views. The knowledge of Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas means their pure knowledge. Extreme views mean the views which arise when one clings to the five aggregates as the self and makes various discriminations thereby. There are two extreme views. What are the two? The eternalistic view and the nihilistic view. We're a honored one. If one sees samsara as impermanent and nirvana as permanent, one's view is neither nihilistic nor eternalistic, but is the right view. 
How's that? When deluded people see that bodies, sense organs, and that which thinks and feels all perish in this life, but do not understand the continuation of existence, then being blind and without the eye of wisdom, they conceive a nihilistic view. When they see the continuity of the mind, but fail to see the aspect of its momentary perishing, then being ignorant of the true state of consciousness, they conceive an inter eternalistic view. World honored one. The before mentioned truth is beyond all discrimination and beyond inferior understanding. Because fools have delusive thoughts and cling to misconceived ideas, they believe either in nihilism or eternalism. World honored one. Concerning the five aggregates, the five skandhas, Deluded sentient beings consider the impermanent to be permanent, suffering to be joy, non-self to be a self, and the impure to be pure. The Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas, with all their pure wisdom, never glimpse the Buddha's Dharmakaya or the state of a Tathagata. All right, I'm going to pause there. I want to comment on a few things that came up. So these two, um, what do they call them? The extreme views. These two extreme views come up a lot in Buddhist texts, in Buddhist sutras, and they are the two extreme views of eternalism and nihilism, as they're called. Or uh, are they called nihilism? Yeah. So. Srimala is, um, you know, they said it at the beginning of the sutra. She's really sharp. She's really clever. And so she has kind of really explained these two views in a very nice way. So she says, when deluded people see that bodies and sense organs and that which thinks and that which feels, when they see all that perish in this life, but do not understand the continuation of existence, then being blind and without the eye of wisdom, they conceive a nihilistic view. When they see the continuity of the mind, but fail to see the aspect of its momentary perishing, then being ignorant of the true state of consciousness, they conceive an eternalistic view. And then she goes on to basically talk about not falling into those two views. That's kind of pretty classic Buddhism to not fall into those two views. So to just quickly summarize what she just said and to summarize the two extreme views, one view is the what we would call scientific materialism. The idea that this is just a bunch of dancing molecules and electrobiochemistry, that there's no nothing here, more here than the biochemistry. And so when the biochemistry dance <laughs> ceases, it's, you're, it's done. That's the nihilistic view, that there is no more to this than that. The eternalistic view is the one that says, oh, no, 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 the mind and the mind lives forever in, in, the, in the body of God, forever, eternally. The mind is immune. Yeah, the body, body is, is perishing, but the mind is eternal, abiding forever, is Atman, and again, is eternal. So if you believe, you know, or not you, but if one believes in this sort of after you die, you will eternally abide in hell for your good deeds, or you'll eternally abide in the kingdom of God, in heaven with God and all that. No matter what it is, if you think it's going on forever, that is the eternalist view. And if you think it ends when you die and that's it, that's the nihilistic view. Those in Buddhism are considered the two extreme views. And Buddhism is a middle path 
definitely between those two extreme views. So she says it in this way, but so you could think of it as, as a nihilistic thing and not understand the continuation of existence. But then you could understand the continuity of the mind and, and mistake that for eternalism and not mistake the moment to moment perishing of the mind. Can you say more about this moment to moment, the momentary perishing? Cause I'm, mm -hmm. I feel like that's on the cusp of something that I have trouble with. Uh, yeah, great. Um, I, yeah, it affords me to, to do a great little, the mini Dharma talk, which I always love to give. Um, actually, this is, yeah, this is really appropriate to tonight, talking about the womb of Tathagatas, right? This idea of the womb and being born out of the womb, like I was saying, right? So the idea of the moment to momentness. So I, you, you already know all of this, Suzanne, I'm just going to walk you through, through it in that way. You're going to laugh, but it's that idea that I often talk about where, so here's the thing that's going on in Buddhism when it comes to the continuation of existence, call it, or call it uh, reincarnation. What they're talking about is this. So I, Michael, have this um, sense that an hour ago, I started this Dharma, I started the Dharma doors an hour ago. And an hour before that, I was getting ready for Dharma doors. And earlier this morning, I thought about what I was going to maybe talk about, right? And a week ago, we were here and it was me, Michael, giving the Dharma doors and so on and so forth. And it goes back and back and back and back and back all the way to when I went to college and learned. And so there's this, my Michael sense of identity and sense of self, which is the idea of I'm holding how, I have no idea, but I'm holding all of that past. So that's the idea of Michael, right? That's the idea of the self, that it was me here last week. And it was me here two weeks ago and three weeks ago. And it's always been me. I was hoping you were going to go here because that, okay, good. All right. That's, so that's the idea. So I have my sense of self. And the thing about it is, is that it's, it's a byproduct of having that sense of self is it sure seems like that was me, right? And what the kind of the subtle teaching of no self is about, is about this sort of what I call the karma train. And the karma train is this idea that the things I'm thinking and the things I'm saying and things I'm doing are kind of creating this cascade of dharmas that then leads to the, oh, I did it again. Look, it's now a new, it's a new Michael with new ideas. And this keeps happening over and over and over and over. And there's a way in which each incarnation of Michael is bumping the next one into existence, moment to moment to moment, meaning that the Michael from a moment ago perished. Oh, you know, poor Michael. But now there's this one and over and over and over again. The idea, of course, is, well, wow, that's really weird. <laughs> that's really... So the idea is, is that we have that sense of self that holds our past, but the idea is no, 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 that's gone. But it is all that that led to this. That's the karma train. And now I'm toot, toot, the train is off and we're going into the future in the karma train. And the idea of reincarnation in Buddhism is that the karma train keeps going back. And look, it goes back to the day I was born, and then it goes back to the day I was conceived, and then it goes back to even before that. And it goes back further and further, and it keeps going back, keeps going back, and it actually extends back, I have no idea. But the idea is that 
in the same way that I can cling to those events of a week ago or a month ago or a year ago, in the same way that I can cling to those as myself, I can cling to what was before that, meaning the being that gave birth to me, the continuity of existence. So there is reincarnation, but there's no self. But there is a self when there is a self, but there is no self. And the idea, by the way, of that selfing, let's call it, let's use the verb, the selfing, is the selfing is the dukkha-ing. The selfing is the dukkha-ing. There's nothing to be had in self but dukkha. And you can really grok that, I think, if you think about how a self, as I just defined it, is this massive holding on to our past. Yeah, that sounds like suffering. A massive holding on to the past sounds like suffering. And so the only thing, if they call it liberation for a reason, meaning this awakening, this liberation, this, which means overcoming the delusion of self, you're just overcoming a, a fantasy of that self. And when you release in that sense, and let go of the fantasy. As I always say, it's not like you poof. It's not like you poof disappear when you do that. In fact, you kind of actually get opened up to the presence. That tathata that I was referring to earlier. And that's why I was so excited to do this talk, uh, Suzanne, because I get to bring it back to this idea of tathata. So, what is tathata? What is this suchness? It's when we are not holding on to all of that past and are actually just present without all, any of that baggage from the past in that way. Thus come, they, they say in that way. Michael, and I think that's why, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think that's why um, addiction is so addicting because, you know, like drinking alcohol, sex, whatever like even climbing you know like you can make it an addiction because in this moment of climbing sex alcohol in this moment or moments plural you forget there is a sense of self and i think be besides adrenaline blah 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 but and hormones and but i think that's what why it's so attractive for us you know this moment of oh my god in this moment of eating drinking sex climbing in this moment, you don't have this, I do something. There is no doing. There is just, or there is only doing, but there is no someone who is doing, so. Yeah, Connie. And I mean, I think I've said this in other Dharma doors, but the, the parallels with addiction and addiction recovery, Buddhist parallels with that, it's, you know, in many ways, the idea of dukkha is the idea of addiction. And what I mean by that is this, it's the idea that I can't be happy without X, Y, or Z, that I need it. I, I need it to be happy, that dependency, we even call it dependency in that way. And what the Buddhist is, what the Buddha is saying is that we actually all suffer from that exact addiction maybe some to these things, some to those things, maybe some into this degree, some to that degree, but the mentality that I can't be happy unless I have this, that's the dukkha, which is this idea that I can't be happy unless I have it. It's not about the enjoyment of these things. And I always say that I'm really big about, you know, whether it's entertainment or whether it's food or any of these things, it's not about the enjoying of it. But it's this idea that I can't be happy unless, I can't enjoy the food unless it's spicy. If it's not spicy, then I'm not enjoying it. it there's a dependency, there's an, uh, it's conditional. My, my happiness is conditional. And there's a way in which, again, we all do this uniquely in our own ways, in our own lives, where we, we put, how can I put it? Uh, that we put like, um, 
qualifiers on our on our happiness that way where it's like again I, there's no better word than dependent in that way and it's important or helpful i should say to notice when there's that going on to anything to anything that kind of you feel a little irritated without x y or z or this this and that notice these things there's no better thing to do than notice them in that way and so connie i'm just riffing off of your comment about that that that's part of this idea of dukkha and so there's a kind of a, a way a logic where it's a, a, a it's why i said earlier it's almost as if the condition is the dukkha like anything conditional is going to be dukkha producing and so then all of a sudden the unconditioned seems like this this you know cool pool of water in that sense to this kind of heat and a a aggravation of the conditioned so sorry but just a comment on that i had one more i guess it's an extension of this train of thought because i and i appreciate that the whole thing with the past and the selves bumping into one another perfectly yeah but in the direction of the future because it, then it gets towards like i always get these ideas about like the bardo and the you know the the, mm. the idea of this kind of like an atman going into the next you know there's that really almost literal sounding thing and and i that's where i get stuck because i don't have a, a conception around around that around the bardo in that sense yeah 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 like like is that the, it, i mean i i try and take it metaphorically and I can, I get it. I get the the sense when we talk about the 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 past, the elude that illusory concept. But then when it's going in, and I know future past kind of illusions in and of themselves, yeah. But but how does this ultimately? How do, how do you sort this? Can you just say a little bit more about that when we're looking at the other end, not going back like to Genghis Khan or whatever? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Um... Well, regarding the bardo, of course, the, the best analogy to think about that is those gaps between falling asleep and dreaming, and then the bardo where you're blacked out, and then you've woken up again. Similar thing going on in terms of continuity, where there is a sense of continuity to my life, meaning day after day after day, or actually day, night, day, night, like that kind of cycle. And it's a, helpful to think about those periods when you aren't, meaning when you fall asleep and there's nothing, and then you wake up in a dream and then you fall asleep again, deep, deep sleep, and then you wake up again. They say that the big bardo is similar in that way, but it's we're talking lifetimes, not naps not uh, dream moments in that sense but similar gaps and but in particular what i mean is a similar sense of continuity what i mean by that is is that you know we may have all at some point in our life had that groundhog's day sense of life that like that there's not a linear continuity to life it's literally just this thing that just it's a it's called a day it starts bright it gets darker and it keeps happening over and over and over again and it's more cyclical not linear but there is a feeling of linearity to it where does that sense of linearity come from well maybe it's a byproduct again of the way that we think about time actually it may it might it may even be a byproduct of the language we use and the way we use language grammar the way grammar is structured lots of things might feed into the way we experience that reality suzanne though the one thing that i will say you've heard me say this a million times it's 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 a uh, an old quote but a, an oldie but a goodie um it's about understanding karma and what they say is, is that if you want to understand your past, look at where you are. Because right now, 
is actually the culmination of your entire life. This moment, as, as, as grandiose as that may sound, every choice, every decision you've ever made in your life has led to this moment. It's the holographic understanding of the universe, right? Well, it, it is absolutely, Connie, but it's also kind of a really like a, a really wild way of looking at our actions. A really wild way of noticing, oh, wow, yeah, everything I chose, like as a, like a labyrinth or a maze, every choice. And then finally it was like, oh, Sunday night, seven o'clock, let's do this. And you, you wound up here. And it was all from your past. So they say, if you want to understand the past, look at where you are. It's all right here. But then we could again, which we won't get into now, into free will. You know, when we say all the decisions that I've been making, I'm like, well, did I really make the decision or was it conditioned, blah, blah. I mean, it's, we don't want to go into that, but I, I find still the, the topic on free will very interesting. <clears throat> one, uh, hold, uh, hold on one second, because we, we got time for free will and, and all of that, that's for sure. I just wanted to finish Suzanne's uh, her, her inquiry about the future. So if you want to understand the past, look at where you are. If you want to understand your future, look at what you're doing. That's the other part of that quote. If you want to know your future, look at what you're doing. Because the choices you're making at this moment are setting up the cards for the future in that way. Let's stop, Michael. Stop. I disagree. Okay. I disagree immensely because, as we know, there are a lot of people who do a lot of damage, you know, and they, whatever, they live their lives, you know, like whatever, money, partners, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's not that easy. It's, I think it's not that black and white, you know, it's not like you do something good today. You know, it's, I, I feel like- Oh, but nobody, you no, know, nobody, I didn't say anything about good or bad or anything about that, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to, in fact, I was even just reading a sutra earlier today about bodhisattvas not denying cause and effect. That it's very, very important that cause and effect, if, if we lose, if we think that there's no cause and effect going on, then we're going to miss something. Now, what we make of that cause and effect, how we judge it, how we label it, is it good, is it bad? That's something else. For example, let's say um, I bought a whole big cake, big cake. I should maybe only eat one slice of the cake. If I eat the whole thing, it might lead to me getting ill, a tummy ache. That's cause and effect. Now, is it bad to have a tummy ache? Well, that depends. Uh, that depends. But the result based upon the cause will be there. And the wisdom is, here's what a tummy ache feels like. And if you would like to have that feeling, you know exactly how to get it. If you would like to avoid that feeling, then you also know how to avoid that feeling. Now, I think, I hope you see what I kind of did there, Connie, that yeah, 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 judgment and morality and good and bad and all of that. No, yeah, we're not talking about that, but that we are karmic agents, I, I, I think is sort of undeniable in a way if that makes sense. Okay, yeah. That, so that's what all we're talking about is, is, is when I say setting up the cards or doing the actions that are gonna create the next situation, again, that's just, that's science, cause and effect stuff. It's all the judgment. That's some other layer. That's the kamadatu. Dean? Yeah, um, sort of uh, jumping off of, um that what you're talking about in Suzanne's question, I, I'm sort of anticipating trying to see where, where the womb goes because the womb seems like it's, I, it, if it continues on, like if it continues through the, the, mm. the bardo, is that an Atman? Uh, and 
so is it or is it the the kind of thing that every moment it's a new womb you know what is the womb kind of thing so that's okay. what i'm sort of looking for awesome all right dean so we got off track let me get us back on track the yeah these two conversations were running parallel and they crossed the tathagata garbha the the womb of thusness is that's one thing that's one thing over here and honestly dean i've been wanting to kind of say it all night so i'll just finish it at the beginning of the talk, when I mentioned the, the Matrix, the movie, when I mentioned the, the narrative mythology of the Matrix movie, I wanted you to be thinking about that movie because I wanted you to be thinking about how Neo comes out of the Matrix. The Matrix is the Tathagata Garbha. The whole Matrix is the Tathagata Garbha. That's not what's being reborn. That has nothing to do with the reincarnation conversation we were just having. The Tathagata Garbha is about how to look at this reality. And if you're looking at this reality as like, you know, made of stuff and made of particles and objectively true and something to be clinging on to, that's delusion. But the idea here is, is it's this reality that this is where Buddhas come from is this reality. So that's about the Tathagata Garbha as a way of talking about the nature of this reality and where enlightenment comes out of this reality. The conversation we were having about reincarnation though, and where, you know, Suzanne's main question is, and she mentioned it a few times, and then you, you uh, echoed it too, Dean, this idea of it sounds like something is being reincarnated though. And the idea is, yeah, what's being reincarnated is the clinging. It keeps clinging. And because it's clinging now, it'll cling again in a moment and it'll keep clinging. And as a result of that clinging is this invention of a history of the self. That and, and it'll always be there because of the clinging and the clinging is a habit of mind that can be undone. So the, the womb is not something where each of us has like, like I got my womb, you got your womb, if, everyone's got one. It's more of a collective uh, scenario, a scenario or context sort of thing. Okay. okay. Well said. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Yep. And and actually, what 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 it, what you're you're asking about, Dean, or inquiring about, I I want to come back to this the you know this um contrast that Sri Mala is doing to early Buddhism, and that the Shravakas and the Pratekya Buddhas they're missing something, and one of the hallmarks, one of the characteristics of that early tradition represented by the Shravaka and Pratekya Buddha is that they did see this world as hell on earth, dukkha, nasty, impure, anything to do with it. And this is like, no, this is the womb of Buddhahood. This is the, this is the womb, this is the matrix. We're, again, we're embryos. We're ba Buddha babies in the embryo, ready to bust out. <laughs> okay, I promised, I promised a free will and deter determinism. Connie, I've been wanting to mention this, so I, I, so here we go. And I, it came up a little bit, and and I should have even done it earlier. So, what came up? Srimala mentioned it. She's all about it. The conditioned, and the unconditioned. So, the conditioned again is relative impermanent, conditional. The not unconditioned is inconceivable. Again, here's the thing about Buddha nature or this Tathagata Garbha idea as it pertains to Connie's burning question about free will versus determinism. In Buddhism, there isn't 
one or the other, what it is, is that we all beings, actually, all sentient creatures, essentially, constantly find ourselves at the cusp between the conditioned and the unconditioned. And we have very, very habitual, very conditioned modes of thinking, modes of behavior. They rely upon past modes of behavior. And there's a way in which a, a lot of, if not most of our thinking is totally conditioned. So on that note, Connie, totally, totally determined, no free will. Even the very things I think I like, I think I want to do this. I was conditioned by society to think that. I was conditioned in that way. Again, to the point where it's almost as if I don't have any free will. But I do have free will. Because according to this sutra, according to the Dharma in that sense, there's the Tathagata Garbha. There's this sense in which though, we can go against the stream, pardon the expression, we can go against the stream of our conditioning. That, the Buddha, that was the whole point. That is the whole point of the Dharma, basically, in my understanding, is that we actually have it within us to not just go with the flow of our past habituations. We can actually make a stand against the defilement, against the ignorance, against the delusion. We can make a stand, but we need to go from that Tathagata Garbha, the sense of that we have Buddha nature, but most of the time we act deluded and we are habituated. Ah, free will is the lion's roar. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent comment. And exactly the point. And so that idea is, is that we have you could call it these two natures, but I wouldn't want to call the unconditioned a nature. I, I would like to keep it as unconditional as possible in that sense. But I hope that kind of like, I don't know. I hope that says something, Connie, about, about all of this, actually. Like not just this question of free will and determinism, but about the whole practice. No, One no. note to that, but don't you think... Um that um, talking about free will and determination is um, to think that way, is that conditioned or not? <laughs> to have this understanding, not to think. Tanya's, yeah, she's like, yeah, oh, wait a minute. All the Bodhisattva patrol. But that's okay, because as soon as the Bodhisattva patrol shows up ringing the duality bell, ring, ring, then that's what I gotta say. That's it, folks. <laughs> that's 8.30. <laughs> Oh, everybody. So wonderful. So wonderful. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Connie, the new host of the Dharma Doors, uh, for any, any, if there's any information. Thank you so much, Michael. That was like always wonderful and it's always beautiful to see all these faces and names.